Hello and welcome. I'm the Restless Geyser. And I'm Woolly Mike, but together we are Modeling, Modeling for Advantage. Advantage. Well, so as part of the um, commemorations for Market Garden on a battle, a Flames of War released a series of um, new edition boxes. This says Sixth Airborne on it. I think it's first airborne. It, it is. Especially because sixth airborne were not at Arnhem. <laughs> yep. Now they wore the same cat badge <laughs> and the same tables of organization, but definitely all of the hero figures in here as well are also um, from Arnhem. So, do you want to tell them what comes in the box? Okay. We get one parachute company HQ, two parachute platoons, one Vickers machine gun platoons, one three inch mortar platoon, one 75 millimeter light troop, one six pounder anti tank section, one 17 pounder lay anti tank troop, four metal wounded paratroopers, four metal supply canisters, eight unit cards, and two command cards. Additionally, four metal warrior teams Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, Major, Roy, Major General Roy Urquhart, Major General Stanislav Sozabowski, and Major Allison Digby Taffen Water. <laughs> one destroyed supply cart, objective marker, one destroyed German howitzer, objective marker, 26 airborne division dice, uh, 26 airborne tokens, and two objectives. If you had a disturbance there, that's because my son just popped in, uh, just to sort of say hi whilst Michael was reading it out. Yep. Hopefully it didn't bother you too much. So, um, yeah, the limited in this box, look, maybe it's FOMO, maybe it's not, but if you want this, you need to get it soon. It's not going to be out forever. Um, Flimsy One do say that they have too many product codes for suppliers to stock, um, but this isn't this isn't a rookie box. This no. isn't for beginners. This is like if you want to do British paras and you don't have them, then this is the box that you want. Really, um, that makes sense as a limited run. I think they can't stock it forever necessarily. Shall we get it open and show yeah, them show, show them the things? Um, so Arnhem, and um, hopefully you've already seen us uh, talking about the US Airborne in Operation Market Garden in our previous video. The British, um, the British too far as it were, great movie by the way. So there's been a series of paratrooper landings up um, the kind of Dutch-Belgian coast and a border uh, with Germany all the way along that border. It's a central main road that running through Belgium, through Holland, and mm. then culminating at Arnhem, which is a crossing on the Rhine. Yeah, so this is these series of bridges are captured, and a carpet of paratroopers have been laid. First airborne army, the first army-sized airborne deployment, although it's quite small for an army. It's only got about three divisions yeah. in it, but it is an army... Um, and the British 2nd Army, or the 30 Corps, is the spearhead of that, is going to push through. The British at the very northern point, which is in the Dutch town of Arnhem, or about eight miles outside of Arnhem is where they actually land. Yep. So these boxes then, as you pour it out, they'll, they'll, they'll see, they're made up of blisters, unlike when you buy an army box, you get loads of kind of loose sprue. With this stuff, they usually are, they're not bespoke sizes, they're just kind of yeah. um, b bundles. And I think, you know, when you look at that kind of limited edition thing, I might be wrong, but I think broadly speaking, the stuff on the left-hand side of that column is what you would get for the money, RRP. And the stuff on the right-hand side is what's being bundled in extra to reduce it. So we'll sort these out and we'll be right back. Wooly will pull the stuff out and I'll look at the unit cards because you do get the unit cards in here. I don't know whether you're going to get... Oh, and you do get pertinent command card. So here we got uh, John Frost and then Blackberries. Oh, that's the Polish. That's for the yeah. Polish. All right. And it looks like we've got the unit cards only for the units that come in this force, but that's fine. You also don't get one of those starter leaflets because it's limited edition. You get this with a QR code, take you to their website. So that's good. Um, what, what are the auxiliary bits do we get, Mike? So we we'll, we'll start with the lovely acrylic and uh, velvet back tokens. I love these. I love these. Yeah. Uh, now, actually, so one of the things we talked about is we have seen other companies make 
um, British Airborne Dyson tokens. And that kind of sky blue on the burgundy background, the maroon background, often doesn't work very well. But these tokens look decent. And you've got that iconic logo all over the Bella, 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 Bella Raffon Astride Pegasus. Bellerophon. Yeah. Yeah. Astride being riding, not doing something dodgy. Yeah. Um, the dice, the, the, the nice white dots, as I say, in, in other sets I've got, you get the that sky pale blue. blue, and from a distance it's very difficult to, to read. determine yeah. some of the... Yeah, although the, the Pegasus icon is in there. So these, the, the, the right colour, um, they're not big dice, but they're not small dice, they're that kind of intermediate. Yeah. Is it 16 mil, something like that? But they've got a decent weight to them, they yeah. roll well. They feel like, look, you definitely don't need these, but what I don't, it's not just nice that they've given you these in this set, is that there's 20 of them. Yeah. So you don't like immediately, sometimes you get like six or something, like, right, I immediately need another three packets of this. Um, now, I prefer 24 because I like Imperial rather than the metric numbers, but nonetheless, 20 is a good number of dice. Great. Yeah. The platoon it's, uh, itself, then, not the platoon, the company, Ooh, ooh, it is special because it's not Parachute Company, it's Frost's Parachute. So this absolutely is First Airborne because yeah. Frost is the colonel. He's the guy who manages to get into Arnhem itself. Second Battalion, yep. This is Anthony Hopkins in the movie. Yep. Yep. Colonel Frost wanted to pack his dinner jacket and so forth because um, obviously you'd need it. Parachute Company Headquarters, and it, this is, look, Frost's Parachute Company. Yeah. I assume this card comes in the bulge pack. The company itself is made up from this Frost's Parachute Company HQ card, which is two points for two guys, two teams with Sten. Then you have to take one compulsory rifle platoon, or parachute rifle, then another compulsory platoon, which is either this or Engineers. You then have an option of taking a third one of these or a glider pilot flight. Because that was one of the things the British glider pilots were expected to get out and fight. As a last resort, they were to help defend the, the landing, uh, landing zones. But yeah. they, they weren't, they were more trained as pilots than they were yeah. as infantry. Then you can take a, a machine gun platoon, a three inch mortar section, up to two 75 mil light uh, artillery, up to two six pounders, up to one jeep recce platoon, or an additional rifle platoon, if you don't take. And in most of these cases, they're actually frosts, frosts, rather than generic, uh, which is interesting. So most of this stuff is coming on here, although what isn't on here is the 17 pounder. The 17 pounder troop is not on. So that would have been um, Royal Artillery attached to the parachute regiment. Yeah, I mean, they did, they did drop with some 17-pounders. Yeah. Um, they had trouble getting most of them moving because the, the movers, I think, didn't work. Or tractors. They didn't arrive. So they lost quite a few of the bigger gliders. And sometimes they couldn't get the tail off the glider. Yeah. But a 17-pounder is not something that's easy to man-pack around. It's massive. Yeah. Um, but they did get some into action. They definitely yeah. did. But not many. So we get we get a frost special figure in here. Okay, um, it's worth mentioning Frost. He's probably one of the best British paratroopers we had. He led the the biting raid on Bruneval to steal the yes. radar. Yes. Yeah, so the Bruneval raid is a uh, is it 1942, 1940? Yeah. It's quite early in the war, and it's through a SOE, but it's a it's a commando raid. Um, it's often perceived as to destroy a radar station. It's not to destroy a radar station. It's to find out how good the German radar yep. is. So although they do trash the station, really it's bring bits of it back. Yeah. And they actually take specialist people with them to yeah. identify which bits they... Se several several um, technical engineers, because they, what they wanted was the sender unit yeah. and the receiver unit, so they know range, frequencies yeah. and so on. Yeah. But these engineers... Um, it later comes out is that they had bodyguards that had two roles. Oh, right. You don't let this guy get captured because he knows more <laughs> about radar than the enemy do. We think so. Yeah, abso yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So he, he does he does Operation Brightling, and, and some people say it's probably the only really fully successful airborne operation 
of the war because it achieved all its aims. All of its objectives. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So they land by parachute mm -hmm. um, out of Whitley bombers, which are not designed the pre, to do it. They're pre-war bombers, yep. but, which means they've got a decent weight. They can carry a, a lot of guys. So they, they land and take on um, sort of like second-rate troops, but they, the Germans get organised very quickly. Mm. Um, I think there were some Luftwaffe troops there as well. Mm -hmm. um, then they fight their way to the beach and landing craft and motor torpedo boats take them back to Britain. Mm. So, it, again, it's probably for things, one of the yeah. proper combined and arms. most of them get back. Is there, is there one section that doesn't make it back? A couple of did. sections didn't even arrive at Bruneval because they right. got dropped in the wrong place. Right. Um, but there's but most of the guys get back. Yeah. yeah. And it's not just a walk on. They fight their way through it. Yeah. Most of them get back. The, so he's in the Bruneval raid. He's, he's then fights in Tunis with the Airborne Division. Yeah, in Tunis here, yeah. And then in Sicily, it's one of those strange ones. He drops as part of the airborne attack on mm. the Primasol Bridge. And that was a vital bridge that they needed to capture for yep. getting Sicily. But at the same time, the Germans realised that. So while the British are dropping, Falschenjäger are dropping at the same time, in the same area. In the same, probably in similar <laughs> landing fields, because there's, there's only so many places so, you can drop a load of guys. Yeah, and then obviously he, he leads the, the Coup de Main to take the bridge at Arnhem, Gets to the north side. Right. Supposed to get there with 9,000 men. Yeah. Arrives with 750 and two support jeeps. Uh, and I think there's some, some discussion with historians about how come he's not leading the brigade. Because there's he's he is a battalion commander. He's just the most senior guy that makes it through to the town. Because as they move into Arnhem, they take three different routes. Yeah. I'll take the high road and you take the low road. Um, and they all get blocked at different points as they're trying to get through. Um, there's some criticism about the dispersal of force there, but they're all they're, when these three different groups they're only like a mile or two away from each other. They're not dispersing their forces; they're exploring. The forces are all still mutually communicable. Um, but the reality is that the Germans put roadblocks up pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, they, they, they mobilise. There's a bit of shock for a couple of hours. But by the time the paratroopers are mustering and moving off their jumping off points on the ground, the Germans already got roadblocks in place. Yeah, so very soon on the first day, you end up with lots of clusters. Mm. Um, go, going back to Frost, obviously, yeah. um, Roy Urquhart is in charge of everything. Yes, he's the di he's the, the divisional commander, I think. He is, yeah. Now, now, with him, he served in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy mm -hmm. under Montgomery and spent quite a bit of time under Montgomery as, on, as, as a staff officer. Right. So a lot of people, that's why he got the plum job. That's why they reckon they gave him the job. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And one, one of the, the, the classic things is, is that when told he was commanding airborne, he said, but I get airsick. Oh, is he the guy that had never jumped before? Yes, and then he was told he's not allowed to jump. <laughs> yeah, he's a paratrooper divisional commander and he's never been in an airborne jump. And I think did, I think Arnhem is his first. He just doesn't get round to it. Yeah. He's planning to do it, but these things, the schedules are so tight that he yeah. still hasn't done Yeah, there were, there were several other operations that were planned. Mm. Um, but the, 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 Something like six or seven. Yeah, but the British advance was so fast that they didn't need to do it. And then eventually... The Allied advance. Sorry. We, we have American friends who are right. viewers, Mike. All right. The Western European side of the advance, rather than the mid, mid, middle Europe, then. Okay. So, yeah, so you've got Eirikart in here. Um, General... Let's have a look at these. We've got, so that, that's Frost is... and uh, Urquhart. So who else have we got in here? Gem Major General Stanislav Sosobovsky. Sorry, we didn't say um, Urquhart in the movie is Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Who is presenting him in a very good light, because I think Urquhart is the moron. And, and, and he was Scottish. Was Urquhart Scottish? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, let's have a look at these. So these, these are metal, we've got some extra bits in. So we've got Sean Connery, we've yep. got uh, Anthony Hopkins. Who's next? Gene Hackman, uh, Major Gene General Hackman. Stanislav oh, Sosabowski. The Yermans. The Germans. Um, so that, yeah, played by Gene Hackman in the movie. Not convincing as Paul. No. At all. Sosobovsky, I believe is how you say yeah. it. And then, again, if this is another sort of like, we call him the all-Polish hero. He fought in the defence of Poland. Of course. In 1939, you mean? Yeah, got yeah, taken yeah. prisoner, escaped to France before France fell, was then 
transported to England and given command of a Polish regiment mm -hmm. and then decided to turn them into the Airborne Regiment. Yeah. So you've got this there. And then in August of 1944, you've got the Warsaw Uprising and yeah. they were actually planning to drop his, his troops. No, they weren't planning to. He wanted us to drop uh, yeah. them on, and we were never going to do that. Okay, so... so we, <laughs> no, that's, that's his story, yeah. right? They're absolutely. The, their expectation was they were going to drop into Warsaw to liberate Warsaw before the Soviets did. Yeah. And when the Warsaw Uprising was happening, the Poles are champing at the bit to do this. The reality is the kind of... The, the Cold War that will be is already a thing during the war. And Stalin has said absolutely no to us supporting the Polish resistance. Yeah. It's, we, the, we are not allowed to fly over Soviet-controlled territory or anything like that. Because Stalin wants the Polish rebellion to happen, the Nazis to crush it, which will kill all of the Democrats and liberal-motivated people in Poland, and then he can take over with a communist regime. That's a very cynical view. I think it's one that's very widely viewed, but not the official Russian yeah. position. But um, there was no way that the Polish army was going to be allowed into Poland because the Soviets wanted it. Yeah. And we weren't willing to stop them. And we couldn't. And of know? course, um, post-war, many um, history. After the operation, Montgomery sent a glowing letter of support um, about... Sosabowski and his um, command and everything. But then he gets caught marshaled. Yeah, because he criticises Montgomery. And yeah. then he... And Browning, because this yeah. is this plan. And so... It, yeah, and he basically gets blamed for it. Yes. For the disaster. Although he doesn't arrive until, like, the Wednesday or something. Yeah. He's on a later drop. He's one of the few people in, the, in, in this operation that's able to turn around to Browning and to Montgomery and say... I think this is a bad idea. I think yeah. you're an idiot. Because he's kind of politically separate. He doesn't owe his command to them in any way, although he has to fight within those armies. And so they just hate him. They just yeah. really don't like him because he won't play ball. He won't play nice because it's like, no, I want to be dropped to Warsaw, mate. I don't want to be messing around doing this foolishness. And then one, one of the other problems for the Polish is that their, their medium and heavy artillery is dropped on the first day. And some of it was going to be shipped in by sea once they captured everything. Shipped in by sea once they captured everything else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think he's even promised that as soon as his men take 5% casualties, they're going to withdraw. Yeah. This is the degree to which they were confident that this, this armoured column that 30 Corps <laughs> were spearheading was going to get there. They were totally confident yeah. of that. They're talking about pulling the paratroopers out of the line when they've got 5% casualties. Well, you can't do that until you've been relieved... Which doesn't happen. He has an awful, awful experience in Normandy. The Polish troops, part of them, they try and cross the river to get to not, to get to Arnhem because they drop south of the river. They cross the river in rubber boats one day, then they have to pull out the next day. They get blamed for everything because and it, yeah, and actually they fought like lions. Yeah, and they dropped in late and they came despite the fact that it was a disaster. So that's Sosabowski. We haven't even shown him a sprue yet. Yep. What, uh, we've got another guy. We have the fourth figure. A Company Commander, 2nd Battalion, Major Allison Digby Tatham Warner. Water, sorry. The Umbrella Man. He's the man with the umbrella. That's um, but actually, he actually was also wearing a bowler hat. Was he? Yeah, he had a bowler Pres hat. Presumably he put his helmet on when he was yeah. fighting. And in, in the film, you see John Frost when he lands using a bugle. Oh, but it's him, isn't it? Yeah, but John Frost had actually, with the problems they had it biting, with people communicating, yeah. and he introduced the old Napoleonic bugle calls mm, yeah. to his division. Yes. And at, at Arnhem, it was with Taff and Water that was using the bugle to yeah. command his troops because they didn't have radios. Because, yeah, when the radios failed. But, but there's always problems with an airborne drop. Yeah. Is, uh, is one of the things. And what they'd started to get a lot better at was assuming that things were going to screw up, yeah. that things weren't going to work. So things like, we're going to assemble, it's mostly, for, it's safe for orders, it's mostly for assembling the troops, as they're, and they're expected to be dropped, all scattered all over the place. Bugle call works first time every time. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So th those are the those are the worry figures. There's also some wounded guys and stuff. Yeah, but just going markers. back to Taff and Water, in the film, yeah. it, 
the, the character is Major Carlisle, who dies just before the bridge is um, taken by the Germans. Mm -hmm. But in real life, Taff and Water survives. And the last radio message that comes out of Arnhem is allegedly sent by um, him and is allegedly out of ammo, God save the king. Right, there you go. <laughs> these are these are fine men. Yeah, I mean, there's no spoilers here. This this battle does not go well. Yeah. Uh, we don't win. <laughs> uh, and of the something like 10,000 guys dropped in and around Arnhem, only a couple of thousand of them survived the battle. Yeah. And like I say, 9,000 were scheduled to get to the bridge over the course of the fight. Maximum mm. of 750. That was all of the the hero figures. Now, they're actually just um, just spiced to put on your basis. Yes. Just on your command basis to make them different. Um, these command cards may affect some Frost is on here, isn't he? John Frost. And then there may be others. But it's just nice to know those characters. And it's such an iconic movie. Yeah. Because it's such an iconic battle, isn't it? Um, I do like them. I think the movie does that a really good job of... There's so many what-if moments in the Market Garden. If only, if only, and every time there's kind of delays and setbacks, there's something else when they get moving again that, that hope has been restored. And there's maybe, just maybe, the truth was basically when, in my opinion, when Gavin doesn't take the bridges in the middle of the battle space on day one when he actually could have done, or on day two when he probably could have done, it's kind of all over then. Well, it's like um, there's there's a new book out by, from Al Murray mm. called Black Tuesday, where he only concentrates on that one day. On the one day, and as in one of his podcasts, he was saying, he said, you know, oh, it's a bridge too far. It's like saying that eating a hundred donuts and only the hundredth one killed you. <laughs> right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, Good point. Yeah. Yeah, the whole operation is super ambitious. Right, so this is the... Infantry. Infantry. Right. Paratroop platoon. So I've got some Bren guns. So how many of these do we get? Lots of... 14. 14 strips. of six infantry. So six that's... infantry, yeah. So there's there's quite a lot of guys here. Look, these are the Sciocast British Paras. If any of you bought the... Um, the the plateau the army box with the Cromwells in that comes with these airborne troops. These were some of the early Sio cast, and some of the early sculpts of these were suboptimal. To be honest, yeah. not the sculpts, the castings were these are crisp and clean, aren't they? And they're also, I think they're new. You know, they said they would, they changed the formula of the material yeah. they were using, which was giving them better better finishes. Because when you look at this Sio cast stuff. When they get it right, the detail's really good. It's really crisp, you know, the folds and the creases in the trousers. These are nice. Most of these guys are in helmets, which is sensible. There are a couple of guys. There's a guy in a berry there. There's He's a two, two on that sprue, which is different. Two on that yeah. There's a couple of guys in their berries. But basically, as cool as the berries may look, they don't actually wear their berries. In combat, now then, what's the performance of the airborne platoon? So Frost's parachute platoons then uh, is nine or eleven points. The eleven points is going to get you seven seven rifle Bren teams and a Piat, um, and the other one is five. You can add an additional Piat team for an extra point. Always worth adding the extra anti tank yeah. weapons for these things. But these Frost's parachute platoons then. Um, they've actually got, not only are they fearless, like most paras, they've got theirs is the glory. So their last stand is two up. <laughs> so Now, on infantry, you actually make last stand checks when you're down to two bases. So it's still significant, because those two bases, probably your HQ and your PR yeah. team um, would be my guess. So you are going to make that role at some point. It's good to know they're still kind of in there at the end. Um, yeah, they, are, they have a sort of three up. Uh, whereas their skill is normally four, they're careful, they hit on threes, they're fearless with the last stand right two. Fantastic infantry. Yep. Really very, very good. And for 10 points, you're going to get five rifle bases and two piats. I, I would go for that all day long. Um, and in terms of how many they're expecting you to make, let's just count out the bases. We've got, we've got bases. 90, one, two, 90 three, figures. Four. Two, three, four. One, two, three. Is that right? So it's a five and a seven. It's probably what they're expecting you to make. A five and a seven is two. 
Uh, two sets. Mm, was it 13? No, so it's making me three, five. Th because one of the bases is an HQ base. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. So you're going to need 12. Yeah, that's right. 12 bases. So, so many makes three, five base platoons. And three so, so many times when I'm getting the figures out for Flames of War, I think, you know, I haven't got enough bases. And then you remember They're the really HQ like bases one, uh, are all the ditty ones. Yeah, but they yeah. still count as a rifle platoon. Yes, they do. It, it just makes it visually stand out. Yeah. Um, so that was the parachute rifles in. Fantastic. You very much do what you want infantry to do, which is uh, stay there forever. Plenty of models, plenty of various poses and that. Yeah. So again, and you can make the two, five, um, three of the five base platoons, or two of the seven base yeah. platoons. Mortar teams. The three-inch mortar teams. Again, it's a Frost's uh, three-inch mortar platoon, uh, which can take us two or three weapons. You've got three there, have you? Yep. Got three there. Again, it's the Sayo cast stuff. They're standard three-inch mortars, so you can drag them around tactically at four inches. You can bombard 40 inches away, and it's four or six points for the two or three gun battery. Definitely take the three gun battery in Flames of War. The two gun battery is so massively inferior. Uh, take it every time. Models are nice. The, uh, the, the supports have all come off. All three of the... It doesn't look like... Me, me, yeah, they've yeah. come off. They're, yeah. they're, in, they're in the box, so you need, just need yeah. to be careful. Yeah. Um, in in my, my library at home, there there yeah. is a book by a guy called... Uh, well, it's the Imperial War Museums. Uh, published his account of he's a he's a mortar platoon guy mm -hmm. at Arnhem, right? And they've published it verbatim, um, but there are there are errors in it. He he, he, he because he's, he's doing it from memory. Yeah, yeah. He he allegedly see see seeing a general dead in a car. Yeah. But then says he, he he's on the road, which there was a, a senior general killed. There is someone. Sh it, yeah. Yeah, but it's not on the road that he should no, have been on. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but again, this is an 80, 70, 80 year old memory, right? In I know, no, it was, it was a, I think it was done in the 50s and the book was published in 74. Right. But it, so it's still a variable history, but it was after the effect. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it, it's interesting to see because he joins the parachute regiment and finishes training just before Arnhem. Right. Um, so his first combat experience is in, mm. and he's on, a, he's on a mortar platoon and he ends up in the centre of the town just behind the bridge. Right, sat and, and, and a piece of like a dead ground in the middle of a, all the buildings. Yeah, um, and one of the things that's not mentioned in here is they did actually have three universal carriers that, that had survived the landings to move the mortar to move the mortars around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in the game, they're good. Uh, in the actual battle, the problem with the mortars is not that the mortars are not great, and actually they took the British pirates took loads of casualties from German mortars. Is they just didn't have the ammo. Yeah. I mean, if you've seen a mortar firing, you can get through ammunition very, very quickly in one of these things, which is why they're a great weapon system. You just set up in a position, lump, you know, 20 rounds, and then pack up and move. Yeah. Or ab abandon the weapons and come back later, because you can put out a lot of fire in a short space of time. But what they're going to bring on here is light artillery. So that's that's good. Machine guns. The Vickers machine gun team. These come in platoons of two or four. Again, you got the double um, the double strip. No, you've got the um, you've got the option to build them as two or four. You've got enough pieces. Yeah, that's why I'm struggling to find the phrase off. Um, so the gun, the gun itself, and the gun, the two halves of the gunner that you have to you have to put together. I assume that that's got something to do with moulding and the fidelity of the machine gun. I like that more than gluing the machine gun to the man. Yes, yes. Gluing half of the man to the other half of the man. Um, and it's just a lot cleaner, isn't it, as a way of doing it? Yeah. Because you've got that flat surface in the, in the like, yeah, where the man has been cut in half. Um, you... The Vickers, though. The water-cooled medium machine gun in World War II. The Vickers. Yeah. I love it. It's iconic. I don't know if anyone else is. The Soviets are still using a Maxim gun, aren't they? Yep. They're still using a water-cooled machine gun. And I think the US Marines are using them in the Pacific, but I think that's partly because they just get army cast-offs. 
Yeah. Um, and that they will get replaced. But it might be a reflection of the fact that air cooling doesn't work so well in the kind of jungle environments. I'm not sure. Well, um, a recent um, D-Day event I was at, there was there was a Vickers machine gun. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, oh, you know, why have they got a water can? And I said, well, that... that so what it catches the condensed water. That's the condenser, the, the steel, that kind of brass yeah. can that they carry around with. The, and the, the gentleman who was in charge of the gun, he said, yeah, he said, um, the, there's a record of a Vickers machine gun going 18 days without having to change a barrel. Right. Because of the water cool, keeps it from warping. Yeah. Whereas the, the Bren gun and the German MG34s, you're having to change the barrel after a thousand rounds or something like that because they heat up. I think up. significantly less. Yeah. I mean, it depends how... Uh, it's the rate of fire that, that, that's the problem. But yeah, the, the Vickers water-cooled. Um, I mean, there's stories uh, on the Somme. There's accounts of people putting half a million rounds through these things Yeah. in, in the course of 24 hours, and they're still functioning. Um, so you see, if you'd seen service like that, but the other thing you can do about with, it, with a tripod-mounted weapon as opposed to a bipod-mounted weapon something like this is that sustained fire and it's things like long range plunging fire which there isn't rules for in here is there yes there is you can fire it as a bombardment so you pitch that thing up fire it over a significant dif distance and you get a whole bunch of them doing it it's just raining bullets from the sky area denial they did this in the first world war mm. plunging fire on the trenches and actually you had if you look at it from a kind of 3D perspective, what they were trying to create was multiple angles of fire on the same position where like strafing aircraft are coming in at this angle, plunging fire from artillery, howitzers is going that way, guns are going that way. And so you were saturating an area from effectively different yeah. height angles and machine guns were an important part of that. But in the first one, they had machine gun platoons, which was literally 60 machine guns all yeah. under the same fire orders. But you can still do it with a pair. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it with one. And it does allow you to fire it as artillery, which is nice to say that that's one of the things you can do with other machine guns, but with an air-cooled machine gun, you're not going to be able to do it for very long before yeah. you need to change the barrel. And you can lock the gun in position so it does continue. Yeah, with, a, with, a, with the Vickers, yeah. And I just love the kind of nigh guy kneeling down or holding the little kind of pistol yeah. grip. So, yeah, it just looks cool. Preferably in his shorts in the desert, though, as, as, oh, the, as a, the iconic yeah. look. The machine gun platoon in Flames of War is three and five points, because, again, it's an airborne one, so it's fearless and all that kind of stuff. The problem I have with machine guns in Flames of War is they're really good at murdering infantry that are not in bulletproof cover. But so is just about everything else. Yeah. What it's good at, I don't need to do. On the flip side, for a couple of points, you can dig them in somewhere and say, you know, you're not bringing infantry over here because it's got a halted rate of fire of six. Yeah. So if it gets to shoot at a pair of these, chucks out 12 dice, that's going to stop infantry moving in the open. Would I take three of them? I don't think I would. I don't think I would. But they look cool. Yeah. They look cool. Next, the 17 pounder. This is, you hear about the eight, a lot about the 88. It's an, it's an iconic gun. Well, this is the British equivalent of the 88. This gun is fantastic. Um, it's the gun in the Firefly. They then make a, a, a ground mount for it. There's an earlier version of this mounted on a 25 pounder carriage. As we were just trying to, this, this is the gun that will knock out King Tigers at a thousand yards or whatever. It's like if it hits, it's going through. As a kit, like all Flames of War guns, it's really simple. Now, you do have to assemble the gun cradle in a couple of parts, and I think the gun will will swing on that pivot. And I think from memory, from when I built some of these. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful little model. Goes together really easily. Got all, got all the details, and it's a great weapon system. In game, the seventeen pounder late. I think I don't think the late is the gun. I think the late is the ammunition. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but with all of these things, the the guns some get redesigned with things like um, muzzle brakes and so forth at different points. 
but ammunition gets improved, which really it extends the life of a gun. So this has got a halted and moving rate fire of two and one, like most guns. It's got the 15 anti-tank power, firepower three up. Um, it's forward firing and has no HE, funnily enough. You don't bring a weapon like this because you want to fire HE -H -E at someone. Yep. It's confident, trained and careful because this is not crewed by paratroopers. This is crewed by Royal Artillery guys. This is the biggest anti-tank gun that we put on a mount in World War, World War II, I think. Uh, it's fantastic. They do have some at Arnhem. A lot of them don't make the drop. Were you saying, Mike, they're, they're assembled in like five or six boxes lashed together? Uh, some of them were dropped in... Uh, the the, the six-pounders were dropped in parts. The 17s were in gliders. In and, gliders. Um, I, I do have a book at home. Of, um, it's a large tabletop book, and it was compiled from regimental photographers from the German mm. side. Yeah. Um, there's a picture of a horse, a glider, mm. with the tail and nose still on, and a massive great hole in the side where they dug, and the, the gun is hanging out of it because right. they they don't kept they cut a hole in the side of the wooden aircraft, uh -huh. but still couldn't get the gun out the right. side because they couldn't get the tail off yeah. or whatever. Which is the not I think that's the normal way of getting them out. Yeah, because they are on wheels. I mean, you can literally drag it. It's just incredibly heavy. It's going to take a group of guys all day to move it a couple of hundred yeah. yards. But they do get some of these into action. The seventeen, um, hours, but many of them don't. Yeah. Be, they're expected largely to defend the landing fields. I think one one of the sources, obviously the. All the books are different, um, but there are claims that they got 16 six-pounders mm -hmm. and four 17-pounders close to the bridge Yeah, during the battle. That's it, out of all the guns that they dropped. Um, and so one 17-pounder would have been dropped with four Jeeps. Right. One to tow it, one for the crew, and two for ammunition. Right. And the six-pounders had two Jeeps. Right. So there were quite a few of tow vehicle Jeeps that did survive. And a Jeep can tow a 17 pounder on a road. On a road, probably. yeah. On a road, on a good day, probably can. Yeah. 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 Before the field gets too money and all that stuff. Um, and the crew figures, It was just the, was it just the generic crew figures? Yeah. I assume it was. Yeah, you get the one, one type crew. of five. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you can see that it's got the massive shell there. Again, it's the side cast stuff. These are all been pretty, pretty clean cast that I've seen yeah, so far. they're looking nice. What do we got next? Okay, so here we go then. The six pounder. Yeah. At Tiger Day yesterday, yeah. um, they had some guys um, from airborne reenactment, and they did fire this. As oh, actual airborne guys. Um, reenactors with a so, jeep. Yeah. So uh, airborne jeep towing one of these, yeah. towed it onto the field, and they did actually rapid fire one of these. A lot, a lot of lot, tanks there. Yeah. So you're, lot, you're there, you're at, right? Yes. Right, okay. So let's talk about the six pounder as a, as, as a weapon system. So the six pounder is the kind of British mid war principal anti tank weapon, and kind of equivalent to the German 75. It's a, I think it's a 57 mil gun. In game, it's got the two and one rates of fire, but anti tank power of 11 and fire four up. So, like a lot of people, a lot of gamers, will tend to fix it on the on a gun's caliber in terms of its performance. The reality is the British six pounder was a 57 mil gun with better anti-tank performance than most people's 75 because it's a much, much better higher velocity gun. Consequently, it being a smaller shell, the bursting charge is not quite so large. So there are, there are advantages with the bigger shell. The HE shell is not nearly so good. But the reason the British held on to the six pounder for as long as they did was because the 75 mils that people would suggest that they were replacing with were not as good. And indeed, the anti tank rating of 11 of this gun tells you it's still competitive. Um, it's not going to deal with Tiger at the front and things like that very easily, but pretty much anything else it will. Very much so. So, the sprue. Um, there's three different barrels on this because mm. it does build the American 57. So yeah. if, you, if you buy the 82nd Airborne box, you're going to get the same sprue. Yeah, the same sprue, but yeah, just build it with a different, different gun. Where are you going to find which gun information you want? Back to this QR code. Look at the product code on their website. Is it the same strip of five guys? Probably a different shell. Yes. No, I think that's the same. But well, these are all kneeling, whereas they're all... Most yeah, it is stand. a different gun crew sprue. They're still airborne. 
um, which is nice. Yep. Very good. So two of those. Two of those. How Only two. Only two of those. Only two. How many seventeen pounders did we get? Uh, five. Four. Four. Sorry. Four. Yeah. That's, yep. that's interesting. Okay. I mean, a lot of people who play British probably already got several of these. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if you bought the other box, you get the American ones. All right. And then last of all, then is the seventy-five mil light. Um, so this is like a pack howitzer or a mountain gun or whatever. Uh, we've not seen it inside yet, but I'm, I would expect this to be to be metal or or cyocast or resin. But it is in fact on sprue. And it's exactly the same as the American. Oh, it's the same, as the, it's same as the American seventy-five mil uh, lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is like literally four pieces: carriage, gun, two wheels. It's a very unsophisticated weapon. Yeah. Well, it's not. No, it's a very simple looking weapon, but it's about making the lightest possible piece of artillery. So by World War II standards, 75 mil howitzer feels garbage. In World War I, people's armies had, th this, is div this is divisional artillery. This is still a perfectly adequate gun. Now, we could make much bigger guns, divisional guns than this by this period, because we were able to make the carriages and things out of better materials, which kept the weight down. But this, you can still carry this in an aeroplane. You can yeah. still carry this on the back of a train of donkeys. That, it, it's that kind of weapon system. Um, and in that respect, you don't want silly things like a gun shield, uh, which is just a lot of extra weight. Crew figures all right? Yeah. Uh, again, different pose, different shell on them. Mm -hmm. um, all very nice, nice nicely proportioned. Um, one guy with his hands over his ear. So I'm not a mortar team. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it is six and twelve points for two and four guns. You can fire it bombardment with five power four up, and anti tank two, or you can fire it direct fire at twenty inches, anti tank power six and five power three up. So when would you fire it direct? You would fire it direct, I guess, at soft skins or. Because even infantry, you know, although your firepower number is better, direct fire, under bombardment, they're not going to get the cover yeah. modifiers to hit. So, um, interesting little weapon system. This, I think, is where, like, tournament or match play will break down a little bit. Because this artillery is actually quite expensive in points. It's got fearless crews that are veteran skill, um, and so you're playing 12 points, but it's firepower and it's anti-tank ratings and it's range of only 64 inches. It means as a, as, as a gun, as a howitzer, it's not very good in the game. And in the game, I can just choose different guns from elsewhere in the book. If you're playing Arnhem, there aren't different guns from elsewhere in the book. Yeah. Um, but when you're building a list, you don't have to use this artillery. It's probably, there's very few situations in terms of like just playing a regular game of Flames of War where you would want this because the only thing it's worth its points for is being shot at with rifles and things like that where it's got better, uh, better stats. Which is a shame. I think the one thing that normally pushes you to do that a little bit is by making it baked into the company card. But I don't think it was, was it? Oh. No, it is. It is integral, so it can help with force morale. I don't think you're going to run out of force morale with these guys. Because yeah. you're going to have several paratroop platoons. But it, but it is that is something, I suppose, going for it. But it's a shame that there aren't more reasons to take things like this. Where the kind of baked yeah. in weapons are inferior to a generic choice you could make as a... You know, because you could just be taking 25 pounders. Or sextons or priests or whatever. Yeah, so it, se it seems to me that you're going to be using the, the, the mortar and machine guns and the 75 for area denial, hopefully forcing them to attack in the direction of your 6-pounders and 17-pounders with the anti-tank rule. So it's, it's a nice mm -hmm. nice infantry unit. If you, now, if you want, 
As a, uh, no, I think as a force to play with, this is going to play completely different from just mm. about most most armies. There's no ta- there's no vehicles here, let alone tanks. There's no vehicles here at all. Um, you can, you absolutely can attack with infantry in Flames of War. You just need a lot of it. Yes. And there is a lot of it here, and it's quite good. And you can take, it's late war, so you can take a decent amount of decent anti-tank within that. And you can take a decent amount of anti-tank weapons, and you've got them alongside. So, it's possible. Now, infantry on infantry is a much, much slower game. But it, it, is, it is interesting. As a defensive force, it's excellent. All that anti-tank and all that high-quality infantry. As an offensive force, it's a real challenge. Which is, funnily enough, exactly the problem that they had <laughs> at Arnhem, which yeah. is that if you don't overwhelm with surprise and numbers, and um, when you still have surprise and numbers, right after the drop, then you're going to find it really hard, as highly trained as parachutists are, and as well equipped as they are, they just don't have the firepower of just regular infantry yep. divisions. I think in the first attack on the bridge, that Frost and, and the guys there repel on like the second day or something, they get through something like half of the P and six pound yeah. ammunition. Like, okay guys. Yeah. Um but then, that then was again, great, but we can only do that <laughs> once more. But that's that's one of the things with the Al Murray book. He only concentrates on twenty four hours. Yeah. They know what's gone before, and it's written from the, the scope of that they don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah. They're there for three days. Yeah. So you you fire um, a third of your ammunition each day, then you get relieved. Yeah. So you know they're ex- they're expecting to be relieved. The the list for this is in the British Bulge book. Yes, which we had somewhere. We could yeah. read about you. So you don't need, you don't need to buy a new army book. And the the, the one that's on the list that's not there is uh, airborne recon jeeps. Oh right, there are recon jeeps, aren't there? They're just in, not in, in this box. It's on the command card. Right. There was an option to take break. Yeah. Oops. So, um, it, it, they, my, again, my research, they, they, 16 universal carriers survived, mm. and most of those were used for gun towing and yeah. ammunition. 39 armoured jeeps, uh, Freddie Goff's light division, recon, mm-hmm. two of them reached the bridge. Yeah. Because some of them got ambushed. Um and then the the pack seventy five six pounders seventeen pounders had their jeeps, and there were also twenty ambulance jeeps dropped by the with the Royal Army Medical Corps. Right. Um, and again, a lot of those didn't survive the landing. Yeah, yeah. Did, like, like so many of these things. Uh, some of them they just take time to get them out. Yeah. And some of them, like that seventeen pounder you mentioned, yeah. and they try to dig a hole in the side of the glider. Yeah. Some of them they never get out because they, they don't have the tools and the heavy equipment to to do those sort of things. Arnhem is a fantastic. Um, story to, to attempt to reenact, and I think if you want to do so, this box is a great place to start. You just need to call it First Airborne instead of Sixth Airborne. Yeah. Um, Sixth Airborne is a fantastic formation, D Day, D Day, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the crossing the Rhine, yeah, which is going to come after this. Very significant. A lot of ca- Sixth Airborne is made out of First Airborne, like ga- the, the no, they're, guys they're two in. No, there's two separate what arms. There's first airborne, six airborne. Six airborne land on D-Day and continue no, fighting. But I think six airborne is made from first. First airborne already existed, and then oh, some sorry, guys yes. leave yeah. and create a new division. Yeah. Yeah. So six airborne land on D-Day. Yeah. Fight through. They're actually withdrawn um, just before Arnhem, uh-huh. and then they're sent back in just in time for the Ardennes offensive. Yeah. And then these guys do. So, one last thing. One last thing. Oh, there's something else. The objective markers. So, we've got... So, we, we had seen these before. This was the same as the ones that yeah. came in there. Uh, so, so, if you want the pair... The German howitzer. The German howitzer, which... Uh, I mean, it says it's destroyed. It actually looks fine. It's just in rubble. Uh, well, the wheels are a bit wonky. Yeah. And there's, a, there's an injured guy leaning against the... Yeah. So, y- your gun is separate, so you can... Have it as it's it's dismounted or whatever. The other the other one is it's a destroyed horse and car, but it, we, we, we're not happy with the. We're oh, upset because <laughs> it's got dead horses on it. And we just didn't. We're not, yeah, you know, we're not, we don't want to. We don't want to. Yeah, we don't like this. The horse didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. Um. 
very nice things. It's, it's interesting that so the, one of the things that they've brought to these kind of limited edition sets they're doing, one is, I, mean, I guess because Arnhem is so iconic, with this and with the US one, there was loads of those kind of warriors, the heroes figures, um, which there weren't so many of in the other of these limited edition ones that yeah. we've seen. But um, in each case, they've been given us these uh, battlefield um, resin Objectives. objective markers, and they're a really nice inclusion. I can see why they don't include them. that. That really is an extra, like proprietary yeah. dice and so forth. I'd like to see more of these kind of sets because I've got enough of a Flames of War collection that really deciding to do something different is about using 50% of the models mm. I probably already will have. And so how do I feel it's different? So, well, I, I want Frost's guys and I want, I want these tokens and things to make me feel that it's different from my other British army. Yeah, and um, as, as I say, Frost's history, he, he's the airborne guy. So, you know, his troops... Even though he's only a battalion commander. Yeah. yeah. His, his troops are probably going to be the best trained, the best prepared. As we see, they've yeah. used bu bugles and, you know, he's, yeah. he's been in the snafus. He's learnt from that, but he's then reliant on everybody else after the first day. And, um, and after the first day, they just can't break through yeah. this hastily improvised German camp group and, and these are like cooks and bottle mm. washers and all kinds of people some SS guys as well um, and some serious vehicles but mostly yeah. it's just every man with a right you know can carry a rifle go and stand on that road uh, one of the sides is what the one guy I would have liked to have seen in yeah. this is fourth parachute brigade they, they take the forest um, and they land on the second day yeah and they land north and are supposed to be working their way around. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was led by a guy called Brigadier John Hackett. He, he's, he's an influential character. Mm. He, he doesn't get much blame for his actions at Arnhem. No. He becomes Supreme Allied Commander Europe. That's a big job, that. Yeah. It's probably why I don't get criticised for his yeah. actions. Because I think he's one of the people that's responsible for the screw up at Arnhem. Yeah. But we've been talking too long. So, but he goes on to have an interesting career, right? Yeah, and um, when he retires from that job and from the military, he writes a book called History of World War Three in 1981. And it is written as a history book. It's, as a it's, counterfactual history. Yeah, but, it's, yeah. A, it's an overview book. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of years later, Harold Coyle, Coyle writes his Team Yankee, which borrows a lot from it. See what we did there? See what we did. And because it, it, it's interesting, because towards the end of Coyle's book, Birmingham gets newt. And that actually happens in the History of World War Three book. Right. And so, you, again, you've got these tie-ins. And so uh, we get uh, General Sir John Hackett, History of World War Three, Team Yankee. Sounds like a good idea for a game. Mm. <laughs> All right, folks. That was our look at the... First Airborne. Sixth, <coughs> the first <laughs> Airborne Division box. You can use it as either... But the commanders are definitely, the unique ones yeah. are definitely from First Air Bonnet Arnhem. Thank you for watching. Cheers, Bye. guys. Bye. If you're enjoying our Flames of War content and considering getting one of the starter sets or starter armies, why don't you think about buying one from our online web store at modelingforadvantage.co.uk? Thank you.